Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I want to say uh, that it's always fun for me to be here. And I want to say that uh, I, I've been on a long passage through life sort of figuring out how the brain works. And in parallel, uh, Annette has been on a long passage of life uh, sort of figuring out how the brain works. And uh, amazingly, our paths have been parallel and more or less convergent. And one of the reasons that I love Annette and what she does so much is because of that convergence. Uh, her, the path of thinking, the development of practices that she's uh, uh, taken on from her great mentor, uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, but, but, but also elaborated in her own way, uh, is so close to what I read the brain needs. And I read the brain, I read, see her implementing the principles of the brain more than almost any other class of physical therapy. It really expresses, I think, what, how the brain is designed to operate in ways that could benefit individuals and especially individuals in need of help, which is, of course, what she's deeply interested in. And, of course, we all, all are in some level of need of help, and that's more or less what my book is about. My book is called Softwired. And it's a beautiful title here, beautiful cover here. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I wrote this book for a variety of reasons. So I am like a lot of nerdy scientists. I thought I could write a book for the, for the, uh, for the citizens of the world that it was, it was more or less obligated to do that for years. That it would be fun to do and it's something I should do. I wrote it in part thinking about my mom. I love my mom very much. I'm one of six children. I had a wonderful mother. I think all of us might think we had just about the best mother. I'm pretty sure I actually did. But my mother, uh, at the age of about 76, 75 or 76, was formally diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, before you get Alzheimer's disease, you lose it. And she'd lost it really three or four years before and had been in a situation where she had to be more or less taken care of. And then she had Alzheimer's disease formally for five years. And you, you could say she lost a decade of her life uh, to this disease. And uh, my mother was a wonderful, uh, in sort of inspirational, cheerful person. And uh, I, I, I know how much she would have valued having those 10 years of life just full of it. And they were denied to her. And this was before the science, my own science, came to, a, to an understanding of the changes that the brain went through plastically on its, on its path southward, you could say, toward the end of life, as it does in so many of us. Uh, most people don't know, aren't aware of the rather terrible statistics that relate to senility and aging. So if you live to have your 61st birthday, which most people in this room will, will live to have that birthday and then look forward and imagine how long they're going to live, and from your 61st birthday going forward, uh, the average life extends another 20 to 30 years. And by the end of life, most of those, the majority of those people will be formally diagnosed as senile. Now, most people don't know that. If you live to be 30 years, 35 years longer, on those, the probability you'll, you'll end life under someone else's care uh, is higher still. And the simple fact is, is that the brain is plastic, and these changes that occur in the brain that are described as neuropathology, in fact, are the end process of a long progression of change uh, that, that, that something can be done about it. And brain plasticity science tells us that something can be done about it. So I wrote this book in part to try to help inform the broader public of the kinds of things that can be done about it. What I really wrote, wrote it about was to explain to people that they, the person they are, the abilities that they have are accomplishments that they can take credit for because they're self-generated in their life, in their brain, by it changing itself, by how they've led their life and what they do in life. Most people do not clearly understand that they are the captain of the ship, that they're in control of their brain, that in fact, in, at any point in life, they have the capacity to actually change their brain physically, change their brain functionally, to be better at almost anything they might dream or want to or be advantaged by being better at tomorrow as opposed to today. Of course, since they're the captain of the ship, they're also perfectly capable of running it into the rocks. And most people do this innocently. 
Most people who run the ship into the rocks do it because they do not understand that they are at the helm and that in a sense they have a personal responsibility to guide it into safe waters. So another uh, main reason I wrote this book in a sense was to help you understand that things that you ought to do or in thinking of your brain from the point of view of it as a plastic organ, what you can do uh, to, 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 to uh, give you yourself safe passage through life. Now it's not just about protecting yourself so nothing really untoward or tragic happens to you. But the fact that you're, you have control of your brain means another way and that you can grow its capacities and another way of saying that you have control of yourself and you can grow your capacities. So another very simple way to think about it is, is that all of us have this incredible endowment, this capacity to improve ourselves at any point of life. And that's another way of saying that it, you, you would be a damn fool if you did not take advantage of this to get the most out of life. And this is another thing, that, reason that I wrote this book. And most people don't know, don't clearly understand, that there are things that they can do and should do to make the most out of life. And you are more or less a damn fool if you don't do it. Okay? So I'm trying to explain that to you. Now, of course, exactly what we do do relates very profoundly to where our interests carry us, and what we love, and what really matters to us. So everybody's journey, and the way we would exploit this tremendous possibility that we carry around with us is absolutely individual. It's one of the most amazing things about plasticity. The person you are has been created within your skull, within your lifetime, by billions of moments of change. About half of those moments, more or less, let's say, come from your interaction with the outside world. And no two people in this world have had the same passage with respect to that, that external world that they've lived in. But even more run history, at least an equal number of events of change have come from inside. They've come from the mental actions and thoughts and operations of our brain. It turns out they engage the machinery of the brain to change just as it changes as we're drinking in information from the outside. From these billions of events, we are differentiated marvelously individually. I once had a conversation with the great privilege of having a conversation with the Dalai Lama. I was asked to give uh, a lecture to, to the Dalai Lama, and I didn't really know what that meant, that lecture to the Dalai Lama. It turned out that he was there and I was here. It was a fabulous experience, I might say. And there were about 20 people in the audience. I would assume that they were very wealthy, but I'm not really sure who they were. <laughs> but I know that my interaction with him was absolutely very special. He was, he's a very special person. I told my wife later that if he was in a room in, the, in which there was a thousand per people, everybody would know where he was at all moments. He, was just, he just has that kind of spark. And uh, he was it's sort of daunting to talk to him because he was so engaged so incredibly in, in touch. And at one point I, saw, I, I told him about the brain plasticity. Uh, I, what I said was, we now understand enough about the brain to have a first level understanding about the nature, the origins of our humanity. And he said, well, he said, and he interjected, which he did uh, maybe 20 times in my talk. He said, well, you might understand it in some general sense. But he said, you'll never understand the individual. He said that because we are all individually different and special. And that's absolutely right. We have this incredible, uh, we have this incredible gift that we carry around that makes us all absolutely unique, one of us, each one of us. Now, if you think about where you've been in life and everybody has a different path, and everybody doesn't have the easiest path to this, to this point, you in front of me, you're not a finished product. You should not think of yourself as a finished product. It's not saying, hey, I'm really happy with what I am now, and let's just, uh, let's just more or less hang on from here on, right? <laughs> you're a work in progress. 
And however you think of yourself, maybe you think of yourself as having certain inadequacies or certain troubles or certain things that you're not good at or certain things that, you, that worry you a lot. Well, get over it and get in action <laughs> because you have the capacity to change. You have the capacity to be a, a better, stronger, more effective person at any point in life. And you should think about what you, you need to do to accomplish that. So I wrote the book in part to, to, first of all, to sort of slap you in the face and say, hey, you have this, you have this gift. Are you using it or abusing it? And if you're, and if you're not take, making use of it, get into, get into get, let's make a, a course correction and think about how you could use it. Now, I also want to say that if you live to be 65, it turns out that uh, we have this sort of odd notion uh, that, that if we have something untoward happen to us, maybe we have something that was, that was identified by a psychiatrist or a neurologist as, as a special problem. We have this sort of notion that we're the afflicted. We tend to think of ourselves as the afflicted. This has happened to me, poor me. And uh, we don't, we don't, one, one thing we don't realize is that if we live long enough, most of us are afflicted, right? And you can say, well, in the old age, if we allow ourselves to deteriorate in old age, we're all afflicted, right? So the fact that you have something that's happened to you in life, actually, by the time you're 65, there's a more than 50-50 chance that you've been to the psychiatrist or the neurologist and they say, hey, this is serious. We gotta treat this. This is a problem, right? It's not unusual to have a problem in life. Life is full of problems. Oh, thank you, I'm gl so glad you did that. I have, a, I have territorial allergies this time of year. I don't know what it is. And uh, I, was, I was actually quite worried about that. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, you don't, just don't want to have the dripping nose thing. <laughs> my, point, my point is, is that, again, you have this asset. You have a brain that can, that, that can be changed, modified, as a function of what you do. And whatever else you do, whatever other treatments you can find, there are strategies that you can adopt that can strengthen you, in, that, that improve you, that can help you, in ways that help you overcome these things that plague us neurologically. This is an area that I have a strong convergence in how I think about things and think about the kinds of things you can do with Annette and with other people that she's trained and other people have followed this line of therapeutic practice because I think it's a particularly enlightened uh, way, a particularly enlightened approach to think about how you can strengthen yourself when you struggle. But. Uh, you should never think, because you have these vicissitudes, uh, you, I, you know, people that cry in their beer or variously feel sorry for themselves or in other ways give in to it and say this is... Remember that your brain is plastic. You have the capacity to be better and stronger. Not just you, of course, but the other people around you that you love, that you care about, that you'd like to see get some help. And uh, I try to provide enough of an understanding in the book of the science so that at least you'd have some notion about how you might, might get started with that and how you might bring change into your own life if, or into the life of people you love by following those principles. I also, and this is a little bit of a, of a personal issue, when I was a young scientist, I was interested, uh, like most many young individuals are, in the great issues of philosophy and psychology. And when I was in a college student, I had a natural inclination. I took many courses in philosophy, and my first instinct was per to pursue a professional life as a philosopher. And, uh, and that's because I was driven, like many young people, to ask the great, what am I, what is it all about questions. I decided when I was about 20 years old that the answers to those questions probably lay within the brain. 
And I decided sort of abruptly that I would pursue these issues in the physical flesh of the brain by trying to understand it and understand its operations, its mechanics. So for a long time, as I say in my book, when people ask me, and what we read in the book is quite a bit my, about my journey and my evolution of my own thinking about the brain and what it's up to in my pro professional life as a scientist. Uh, people would ask me what I did. You know, I love to tell them that I was an applied philosopher. <laughs> and what I meant by that was is that overriding everything else I did, what I was interested in was, asking, was answering these great questions. Of course, I didn't answer them personally, but the science has more or less answered them across my professional period of my professional life as a brain scientist. So it's explained to us not exactly where the light comes from. No one can explain to you where the light comes from. No one can explain where that little precious thing that represents the moment's awareness or our consciousness comes from. We see phenomena that seems to be correlated with it. We see aspects of the machine that seem to be on when the light is on. But that's as close as we come to a real explanation. But what we have come to understand is why the brain does what it does, why we behave the way we do. We have an increasingly deep and complete understanding of that. So we understand why you do what you do. And in a sense, from the point of view of thinking about morals, ethics, about how we organize our societies, about jurisprudence, about the great issues that relate to the civil structures, that's the most important issue. Why do we do what we do? I might say on that side, brain science comes down on the side of the sociologist. It puts more weight, more weight than has been put on by the general public on the brain's contribution in its evolution and the way it changes in individuals to how they behave and what they do and what can be expected of them in their life. So let me give you a simple example of something that's driven me nuts ever since I first appreciated this as a scientist. And this is just an example. As a child is born into our country, and more than a million are a year, in which they're born into a home in which there's substantial abuse or neglect or high stress. There are alterations of the brain that we know occur, and those alterations are destructive. They actually change, negatively change the capacity of the child of the brain to advance plastically in the normal way, and they distort that advance in a number of predictable and understandable ways. If the child comes to school, if the child comes to school and is impaired in school, which the great majority of these children are, and the child also has a comorbid, we call it conduct disorder, the child can't control their behavior. The child is very impulsive and very hyperactive and can't control themselves. Commonly has fits of anger and other things that come directly out of the brain changes that come from their distorted early experiences. There are about three million boys in American public school that have a conduct disorder and are failing at school. A very large proportion of these children do not finish school. Now, it turns out that about half the time in school-aged children from the first grade, if this problem shows up when you're in kindergarten or the first grade, to the time you graduate from high school or leave school, the conduct disorder is resolved. And usually this occurs because something happens in the child's life that helps them overcome, that helps them feel good about themselves. Maybe they're good at sports. Maybe they have inspired teachers or something else happens in their life in which they make a positive transition in their own self-valuation. And they get past the conduct disorder. Now, if they don't get past it, about 60% will commit a felony before their, before their 30th birthday. Now, we've known this. We've known all about this for 35 or 40 years. And what we do as a society, even with this knowledge, held by egghead scientists all over, is we blame those children from day one. From the time those children come to school, we blame them. 
and we continue to blame them right up to the time they die. And what they have is distorted plasticity that comes out of their life. Now, I might say many people in this room have distorted plasticity that comes out of your life that you've overcome. Or maybe some of you are still struggling with it, but you can overcome it just like those children can overcome it. Of course, it takes effort. We have to care. We have to understand that the brain is plastic. We understand that every brain on some level is sal 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 salvageable that every con one can be better and stronger and more effective next year as opposed to this year. Now, if we understood this more universally, and we actually lived with it and took it to heart, and we didn't think we had millions of people among us that we can just throw away or lock up or get out of sight because they're annoying the hell out of us. If we understood the potential of using this science for human good everywhere in the world, what a difference it could make in the world. So this is another reason I wrote this book. I mean, it's another little yelling into the wind, saying, look, we understand enough about these things not to be so cruel, not to be so unfair, not to be so stupid. So it's uh, sort of alarming to me as a scientist for a long time, you know, we sit in our offices in the Eggheady University setting and we, we more or less, um, we have a lot of fun over there. We're well paid. We get lots of holidays. We can take nice sabbaticals in foreign, on foreign soil. They generally are respected, at least among the nerds that we operate with. <laughs> but of course, like every other human being, we're part of a social family and we have obligations. And it's an obligation that I feel deeply. We have obligations to deliver the goods. I was a scientist that almost all my life, uh, well, all my life as a scientist, I was paid by you. Um, you didn't know it, but you paid <laughs> generously. I often, said that, I often said so generously doing something I love to do that if, they would, if the, the state of California and the federal government decided to cut my salary in half, I wouldn't quit. I still had a pretty good job. But in any event, we, are, we have a responsibility to deliver the goods. I was very fortunate as a professor at the University of California. I was actually the first professor in the history of UCSF that was allowed to found a company without losing my position. And the reason that I, that I was allowed to was that I had a conversation with the chancellor, who was a wonderful man named Joseph Martin at that time and uh, just a great human being. And I convinced them that I was not, I did not, I was not trying to found this company to make money or to do any such, such a thing, that, but it was necessary to deliver the goods. And he accepted that. I mean, I'd set up conditions in which it was clear that that was my motivation. And I was actually allowed by the University of California to do it a second time. And so I was both the first and the second person allowed <laughs> to do it. <laughs> but it's all about delivering the goods. And that's what this book is. This book is an attempt to deliver the goods to you. I wish it was more clearly written. I wish it was more profound. I wish, I wish uh, you would all believe everything you, you read because it's all absolutely true, undeniably. There's not a fault, false thing in it. Just teasing, of course. <laughs> Nothing false in it that I know of. I hope you, I hope you read it. And, uh, and, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you see it as a, a way to help you understand yourself a little more, to help you understand how to take control, and uh, with your hand on the tiller, to go to a better place. So I think I'll just leave it at that, and, uh, and we can... Uh, maybe have a few questions and have a conversation about it. Thank you.